bringing relief to those in pain. That is the pursuit of the International Association on the Study of Pain. The IASP is tackling all aspects of pain through research and education, awareness and advocacy. This is the premier global meeting on pain, bringing together scientists, clinicians, and healthcare providers from around the world and across multiple pain disciplines. From Toronto, Ontario, this is the 2022 World Congress on Pain. This is IASP TV. 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 Hello and welcome to the thrilling third day of IASP TV. I'm Atria Godfrey, your host for day three from the World Congress on Pain. Happening today in Toronto, we sit down with this year's John D. Lozier Award winner, Mike Nicholas, about his dedication to the promotion of pain education and research. We will take a trip to the University of Michigan to see how their chronic pain and fatigue research center is utilizing a patient first approach to pain management. And you will get to hear from some of the researchers unveiling their poster presentations today. Remember, you can always see news and highlights from IASP TV anytime on the dedicated page on the IASP website and on our YouTube channel and Twitter feed. We kick things off today with our sit-down interview with Michael Nicholas, this year's recipient of the John D. Lozier Award for Distinguished Lifetime Achievement in the Clinical Science of Pain. Michael, congratulations on your award. Thank you for bringing this beauty here today. And you are the very first Australian to receive this award. Yes, that's, that's right. Congratulations. It's hard, hard to believe, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, let's just start off with what does yeah. it feel like to be recognized by your peers in such a manner? Well, it's a great honor. Uh, and I'm very um, appreciative of it. But I said in my opening um, today that really it's also about honoring John Lozier. Absolutely, so you spoke about your presentation today. The biopsychosocial model of pain is 40 years old. You say it might be time for a reassessment? Yes. Why so? Well, um, I think uh, if something goes for 40 years. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little dated. <laughs> well, there've been other assessments along the way. None of them had actually done what I thought needed to be done. When I examine a lot of literature, not, many are not really using it. I thought it was probably time to remind people that uh, we've drifted off the track okay. and we need to get back on the track. Okay. You also bring about what I think is a very interesting perspective in that we can actually prevent pain from becoming disabling. Yes. How so? Well, um, if you, uh, it's always, you know, it's very hard to stop someone getting injured. Mm -hmm. uh, it's sometimes people get, have no real injury to, uh, to speak of, but develop some pain. But where they go from there uh, is influenced by how they react to it, the context in which it occurs, and the reaction of people around them, uh, and the way they get treated. Mm -hmm. uh, so all of those things are modifiable. We can find ways of working in these systems that are more effective. It sounds like you're saying we've got to work in a collaborative manner in order to do so. And that's uh, something that your award actually highlights as well, as somebody yes. who's worked in a manner of collaboration. Exactly. Yes. Now that's, um, to me, uh, none of us have all the skills. Mm -hmm. And it would be, we don't have the time to do it all anyway. And so we do need to work with others, but we need to work out how to do that in a, an efficient way. Uh, and I describe one of my studies where we did that in injured workers um, who tend to have the worst outcomes um, mm. under a compensation system uh, everywhere. Uh, but I showed that if you change the way you applied this, you'll get better outcomes than usual care. It's, um, uh, it's up to us to make people aware right. and we can make changes uh, that will make a difference to people's lives. And so many people dealing with chronic pain do have that sense of hopelessness. Yes. So hearing you say that has got to give them you know, something to hang on to. Well, I, I hope so. I've seen a lot of things develop and be tried. Um, but at the end uh, of the day, uh, it really does come down to self-management by the patient. Mm. And most health professionals haven't been trained in how to teach patients how to live with their pain. And that's what we need to do. Congratulations on your award. Thank you so much for your time today. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for the time.
Turning now to the University of Michigan's Chronic Pain and Fatigue Research Center, where they are providing treatment to every individual in a very specialized way. Let's see how. The Chronic Pain and Fatigue Research Center is probably best known for the work we've historically done in fibromyalgia, but we literally have over the course of our existence studied at least 20 different chronic pain conditions. Conditions like interstitial cystitis, sickle cell disease, low back pain, osteoarthritis. So pretty much any condition where the primary symptom that the individual is experiencing is pain is a condition that we're interested in studying. So in the late 1990s, we were at Georgetown University and there was a donor of Georgetown University, Arthur Calcagnini, who gave a big gift because his daughter had chronic fatigue syndrome. That's also why the name Chronic Pain and Fatigue Research Center has fatigue in it, is that we actually always have been interested in studying some of the symptoms like fatigue and sleep problems that often accompany Pain. But that center and that gift at Georgetown in the late 1990s sort of propelled us to become the Chronic Pain and Fatigue Research Center and then we moved the group to the University of Michigan in 2002. We feel it's incredibly important that those of us that are doing research first and foremost focus on patients with chronic pain. That's what we're here for. We're here to make the lives of people with chronic pain better and the research we do tries to better understand how we can do that. So by just putting the patients front and center, it just grounds everyone when they're doing research. It's not that we got a big grant or that you got a manuscript, it's that you made the lives of chronic pain patients better. There are several ways we collaborate with our community and patient partners. For example, a lot of our research surrounds non-pharmaceutical interventions for chronic pain conditions. To increase intervention engagement and efficacy, we work closely with our partners to ensure that these interventions are responsive to what patients want and need. The Backpack Study and the BEST Study as well as the PRISM Study are all funded by the National Institutes of Health and each in their own way help us better understand who responds best to what treatment. We look at physical therapy, we look at a couple of behavioral treatments, and we look at FDA approved medications. And the PRISM Study takes a look at cognitive behavioral therapy that's also enhanced with resilience activities to make the therapy much more engaging and entertaining and hopefully make it something that helps a person build their resilience. And for that study too, we're also looking at who responds best to this treatment and also how does the treatment work. Some of the work that we have done in an effort to try to understand the relationship between peripheral and central inflammation involves taking whole blood or immune cells from our patients and stimulating it with particular kinds of toxins. Some of these will stimulate receptors on the immune cells and then we can measure the inflammatory response that happens afterwards. And what's very interesting about this is that we find that we're able to tell the difference between patients who have localized manifestations of pain and those who have more widespread manifestations of pain. We conduct clinical trials where we use longitudinal neuroimaging um, to try to understand how treatments are causing analgesia and altering brain function and structure in, in pain patients. And we can use these results to understand uh, how treatments are, are working and also to develop new treatments. Wearables are just like what they sound. They are monitors that people can wear as they go about their daily life. And the great thing about wearables is that uh, whereas people might self-report on pain with a wearable, you can get at daily functioning in a very objective way. So you can measure things like how much a person is moving or how functional they are, or how well they're sleeping or how stressed out they are um, just by placing a wearable on their body or letting them wear a monitor. What wearables can teach us about people living with pain uh, is mostly about the function. So it's a little hard because we think of pain as being a perception, something that people self-report. It's a little hard to measure pain per se with a wearable, but what we can measure is people's functioning and how they're doing, either in response to a treatment or just day to day. One of the strengths of our program is the ability to develop new technologies. 
So over the years, we've collaborated with faculty in the College of Engineering and computer scientists to develop new technologies for QST. Quantitative sensory testing, or QST for short, uh, is a set of methods that uh, are used to measure sensory function. And we can look at both increases, or what you might call a gain in sensory function, phenomena such as hyperalgesia or allodynia. And we can also use it to measure losses in sensory function. These methods are used both clinically uh, to a degree, uh, commonly in the diagnosis of peripheral neuropathy, but also in research. And in research, we are able to use these methods to do uh, mechanistic phenotyping, to better understand the mechanisms that might be underlying pain. For many years, the Chronic Pain and Fatigue Research Center has been a leader in the development of online and digital pain self-management um, approaches and programs. Pain Guide is our current offering, and Pain Guide is composed of a number of different topics. Uh, it has education about many different types of pain. It has education about different types of interventions. The heart of Pain Guide, however, is a focus on self-management or self-care. The reason why it's, it's important to offer digital intervention is, is because not everybody can uh, have a coach, not everybody can come in, into the, the pain center uh, as frequently as they might like. And so this is something that they can do at home. One of the things that's unique about the CPFRC is that we have studied a whole variety of different treatments. We've been quite interested in um, studying a broad range of therapies, which now um, often go under the umbrella of integrative therapies. Acupuncture and acupressure are now becoming more and more integrated into Western medical approaches to treatment of pain partly because they're cheaper and they're less invasive and they're more of a gentler way of approaching pain symptoms. The Chronic Pain and Fatigue Research Center has actually been very interested in acupuncture and acupressure for many years. We were one of the first centers to be awarded a National Institute of Health grant to study uh, acupuncture in the role of fibromyalgia. And actually Dan Claw, our director, was the PI of that grant that was one of the first awarded by NIH. So the work that we're doing is multifold, actually, when it comes to paying cannabis and uh, psychedelics. So part of what we want to do is to understand what people are actually doing. So doing some survey studies to get a sense of how people are using, say, cannabis or psychedelics in the pain management context, what sorts of decisions go into that, as well as then the outcomes, and what do they attribute that to? We have so many terrific junior faculty that are very, very committed to making the lives of chronic pain patients better. Some of them have chronic pain themselves. We're getting patients more and more involved in these programs and projects. It's not about us. It's not about the faculty and their grants and their awards. It's that I'm just excited about what we are going to be able to do to make the lives of chronic pain patients better. One of the most exciting parts of IASP is the daily poster presentations. This is where hundreds of researchers can finally unveil their years of research in front of the perfect audience. My research is the study protocol for neuromuscular electrical stimulation for the treatment of diabetic neuropathy. We're interested in trying to tease out which aspect of the pain experience might be most influential in older adults with chronic low back pain. It's really important for me to come here, present my work, interact with pain researchers, meet new people. It's wonderful. It's a big opportunity to network and I'm really, really happy to, to be here. Generally speaking, geriatric pain mechanisms and groups are not as represented in these areas of research, so it seemed like it was the best place to present the findings. And who better to discuss just how life-altering chronic pain can be than someone who is living day-to-day -day with that diagnosis. Joining us now for our Bridging the Gap series is Gilletta Belton. Gilletta, thank you for your time this morning. Appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. So let's talk a little bit about your story. How was it that you were originally injured? What happened? And what were the days like that followed? Yeah, so my pain first started back in 2010, January of 2010, when I was working as a firefighter paramedic and just on a routine call, stepped awkwardly off the fire engine and felt a twinge in my hip. 
I didn't really think anything of it at the time, but that twinge just set me on a path of ongoing worsening pain that didn't get better. It didn't respond to treatment like it should have. Um, and ultimately ended up in me medically retiring from, from a job or a career that had defined me. I look back at that time now, all I see is like pain and distress. I'm sure you're happy to put that behind you. Yes. So how are things today? What's your day to day like? So now my day to day is actually more focused on advocacy work and not my pain, which is really good. Um, my pain is it over time has gotten better and better. And most days now I live comfortably where I don't even notice it. Great. I love that you have really turned, you know, this experience that you've had, which was not a wonderful one to into helping others. And you've really gotten heavily involved in advocacy. Did you ever see yourself being a pain advocate? No, no, <laughs> not at all. It was definitely an accidental path that, that I didn't expect to be on, but I'm grateful to be on it now. And talk a little bit more about that and your involvement with GAPA. Yeah, so GAPA is an org, or it's a task force right now, but we're going to become an organization um, where our mission is integrating lived experience perspectives into the study and research and education about pain. Um, and it brings together people with lived experience of pain that can share their perspectives and expertise because they live with the condition that is being studied with clinicians and researchers to be able to figure out better ways forward in both understanding pain, treating pain, researching pain, those sorts of things. You mentioned something earlier that I thought was really interesting and in that as a patient, you are constantly having to prove that you were in pain and that actually makes overcoming the pain that much tougher. Yes. In, in the workers' compensation system that I was in, it can feel very adversarial from that patient perspective, and you can feel like you're in a constant position of having to prove that you're in pain, because pain is invisible, and if it's not seen on a scan, and I had surgery, I ultimately had surgery, which was supposed to have fixed me, but it didn't fix me. I still had ongoing pain that disrupted my life, ongoing pain that led to the medical retirement from the fire service, but you couldn't see it on a scan. You couldn't see it on an image, so it was the sense of constantly having to prove that I was telling the truth about about my pain which is a really distressing and dehumanizing position to be in because you're not believed you're, you're considered not trustworthy um, and some of that's just baked into the system to doubt patients rather than believe them um, and that's kind of what led me down the advocacy route like how do we change that and would you say that's the biggest thing you are fighting for with regard to your advocacy right now yeah I think that that learning Learning from people in pain is a huge gap that we, we need to fill because we know that pain is a sensory and emotional experience, but we really haven't dove into understanding that emotional experience as much as we have like the biology and the, the science of pain. So I think the more we learn from people who are living with pain, the better we will understand it, the better we'll be able to do something about it. Well, thank you so much for taking a very tough experience and using that to help others. Thank Appreciate you. Appreciate it. Thanks for your time today. Thanks. That's a wrap on day three of IASP TV's news and highlights from the 2022 World Congress on Pain. We hope you're enjoying the insightful interviews and specially curated content from all across the globe. Remember, if you've missed any of today's features, you can always watch it back at any time on the dedicated page on the IASP website and on our YouTube channel and Twitter feed. We have still got one more jam-packed day, and we hope you'll join us. We'll see you right back here tomorrow on IASP TV. Have a great one.